Welcome to the Frontline Podcast, brought to you in association with the Atler Group. Atler Group is a collaboration of businesses with a collective history of over 130 years, bringing financial solution to its clients in the world of accountancy, audit, advisory, fiduciary and retirement benefit solutions. Visit atler.im today. On the Frontline Podcast, we chat to leaders in business and successful entrepreneurs to bring you their in-depth and bite-sized opinions that will add value to you and your mind. Brian, Natalie, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Uh, So we're uh, in Mental Health Awareness Week, so it was a good opportunity to have a chat about how I listen, what you're doing up there, etc. So perhaps to start off with, I spoke with uh, some of the team a year ago now, we'd had big lockdowns, I think we had some mini lockdowns at the start of last year now, which was 21, losing track of time. Yeah. Uh, I suppose, what have you seen since then? Uh, how, how are things? How's, the, how's everyone's mind, I guess? I think from the service in terms of schools, school provision, therapy provision, we've noticed an increase in referrals with iLesson. Um, so much more people feel like what were small worries have built up enough that they need someone to talk to. Um, our listen has different levels, so they have a listening service in most of the secondary schools. Um, and that's quite popular. It's not a drop-in, so teachers have to refer people in, and that's full. So it's full now. And from that, teachers have realised the type of people that then need to be referred up as well. So to be able to talk to uh, our therapists on our listen base as well. And it sounds as though there's been more interest in the, the business side as well. So the people asking for mental health first aid training, uh, businesses noting the impact of COVID and also needing some space to talk about that. And also just to recognize what's going on with people because the different thing with COVID compared to other things that might be happening in the world is it's affected everyone. So in all aspects, so almost in a physical way, people kind of notice the physical burnout from that. Yeah. Would, would the journey of people's mental health, is that spike because of COVID, in your opinions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think from a uh, workplace training um, side of things, we've had to, everyone's had to adapt and we've had to adapt the way we deliver our training. So uh, whether it be face to face or, you know, via Zoom or Teams, and people are recognizing mental health good mental health and poor mental health and so companies are now starting to think right we need to help our our staff we need to put some value there we need to be supported and they want to learn more about it so they can grow in confidence of knowing about mental health and spotting the signs so quite a lot of our our training uh, services uh, courses uh, we've now done bite-sized ones which are like an hour and a half we've got full day ones and half day ones depending on how much detail people want to learn and um, we're always adapting and flexible with that and it has increased the amount of people that are wanting this training so we knew we had to adapt when we were in lockdown and we're still making the, and we're still offering those same flexibility with the methods of how we deliver okay so for corporates that's about corporates reaching out to you yes are they using i suppose the let's do the off the shelf or more bespoke training as they feel necessary for their for, yes for their food. definitely and you know we 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 don't have to have it in one place. We can deliver it at people's organisations on on, on site or we could do it in neutral locations. And we have open book ones where it doesn't have to be a set organisation. Anyone can uh, enrol on that course. So we want to make sure that everyone has access to learn about mental health and be aware of it and, you know, how to help people and signpost and practical tips. So if it's it's available, then everyone can access it then. Okay, cool. Brian, quick question on... Uh, well, not a quick question, sorry, it's probably far from a quick question. Let's chat a little bit, if that's okay, about, uh, in educating myself, we talk about mental health and we talk about mental illness. Mm-hmm. I assume there's a grey line somewhere in between where you kind of, fall, I say, fall into different camps, but where the, yeah. the, the assessment changes, I guess, from one to the other. Talk about that, and is, there, is, the, is that grey area sometimes create difficulty because one is a mental health issue and another one's mental illness and again in the media do they get do you see them getting mixed up and therefore sometimes you find it hard or that helps yeah yeah it's definitely broad <laughs> um but also the word if you add in well-being into that as well so people talk well-being mental health and then mental illness as well so i think 
the the idea of mental health is, is, has become broader and um, potentially in a helpful way so people will be able to talk about something going on for them um, so if they're feeling very worried if, if they're feeling down um, so it's helpful on the one hand that people might feel more able to have a conversation um, but for some people because of the history where you know well-being didn't really exist as a word um, really only mental health meant mental illness that a lot of people might stay away from talking about that and even if someone feels like they want to open up the person feels oh I'm not really an expert so I'm not sure really what to do so mental illness you could say then is is where someone has to have a diagnosis um, and it, it might have been in the past that only say a psychiatrist could do that diagnosis but if you were to go to your GP you feel down um, they would then give you an antidepressant potentially as a first line offering um, and technically you then have a diagnosis of depression so um, there's potential a, a danger if it's seen as too exotic so that if you had to have a diagnosis then of course I couldn't understand that what happens with people mental health is suffering is that that then can become mental illness uh, and I think a lot of people can understand what it might be like so yeah, say with depression if someone's ever lost someone or someone's had a relationship breakup the same types of very strong feelings of um, sadness of course but the, the ways in which they can impact them in what's the they call the biological symptoms of depression so have no energy appetite being affected so either eating more or eating less um, sleep being affected you're not quite liking to do the same things and everything feels like what's the point and that struggle of trying to get out of bed in the morning and the fact that's so hard there's different points in that where lots of people in their lives could have understood it so sometimes when you give a diagnosis of depression someone feels like they've maybe never been there so they couldn't quite understand it but I think in parts of people's lives they would have had similar feelings to it the idea with the diagnosis then it extends to it's happened for a certain period of time it's really impacting someone's life and then if they see a GP or mental health professional then it's okay it needs an intervention so that's what requires perhaps the diagnosis and you've got moderate and severe really in terms of mental illness um, and there will be um, what is considered more severe mental illnesses as well that are out there um, and again they can seem exotic but I think it's helpful that people try to explain it how it affects them um, so that people know what they're good for you know it, am I a helpful person to listen to um, people might be worried about giving advice but what we know is that even giving someone what we might call emotional MOT advice is still helpful uh, throughout the spectrum. So making sure someone's eating okay, sleeps okay. Um, the exercise is quite a low bar. So any type of activity, just kind of moving, that kind of triangle is what can keep people better yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. So, so talking about, uh, I suppose, mental health, we touched on earlier around the, you know, the, perhaps the impact of of COVID and lockdowns. Read a study recently where 4 million people in the UK, I know you come from the UK yourself, so I'm sure you've seen this, of a quarter of them seem to be mental health, well-being, that's the term to use around children. Yeah. Uh, seems a shocking number really to, mm. to consider. Talk a little bit about that, what you're seeing as well. I presume that's replicated and that kind of ratio is on the Isle of Man, I guess, from what we see. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just moved over from uh, London Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service, they're called CAMS, there. And um, what was interesting is that the numbers that seem to be here in the Isle of Man with a smaller population are much higher. Um, and what we've noticed generally since, uh, since COVID is an increase in anxiety, um, some low mood, perhaps as a result of loneliness, perhaps being you know, trapped in, uh, at home. Um, that's increased uh, also we've noticed that OCD thoughts type so it's called thoughts and ruminations so that's where perhaps you don't have to do something to bring relief that you're uh, caught in your thoughts that that's increased we also know that um, there's a recent study that showed that eating disorders has increased as well and not only had it increased but it gone down the age range so someone that would have had a diagnosis now moved down to pre-teenage um, 
So the numbers are quite high. There's a quite well-known um, phrase that lots of most of adult mental health problems started at around age 14. So that's where Alison is trying to target at the earlier end of the age spectrum so that people can have a way of finding a way to work through some of their feelings. Um, and then as adults, they will have strategies and know how to cope. Um, but it is high. Yeah. Um, and it's got higher over COVID. Yeah. Have you found that as well with your role as well, Natalie, that children, that's a, an area of concern, I guess? Well, yes. I, 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 Brian knows more about it than I do. But yes, I, I, I believe that it is, is higher. And when we are delivering corporate training, a lot of people engage with their experiences and a lot of them are parents or guardians and they talk about their their children and you can see that the tips that are taken away is going to help them in regards to what they can do next, what support is out there for them locally, um, even being aware of waiting lists so they've got some sort of expectations so they're not knowing it's going to be you know done the next day and an appointment's going to be there the next day and you know there's different things available. So you've got, you know, not only just I listen, but locally in regards to grief, for instance. Um, so there is a lot of talk yeah. in those sessions about, about young people. So on the corporate side there, do you, do you see uh, particular patterns of where people are looking for, so I speak with our hat on our, and corporates, that staff at, you know, are looking for help in particular areas. Yeah. Do you see those? Yes, we do. I think because there's more awareness now in the, in the, in the work, workplace, um, managers are now looking out for spotting the signs and they're talking about it with their team meetings or part of their values and their cultures. Um, so it's because it, they've got more knowledge of it, they've got more confidence to recognise the signs, um, especially if they know their team really well. It's, you know, how they think and they feel and they act, you know, that's what they're picking up on. Um, so they are picking up on them and then knowing where to go where to go next. People are leaving our training sessions wanting to build up a better culture for the workforce with well being, you know, in in that whole thing. So they're thinking about strategies to put in place. They may be a large organization that they might think, right, we need to get some mental health first aiders. So mental health first aiders are on the increase within the workplace, which is really good. So they attend a course every two, three years, and obviously they will have um, research or they'll be able to get up-to-date information on, on that actual position and how to help the staff. Bigger organisations have private health benefits, so they've got counselling involved in that benefit, and then it's employee uh, employee assistance schemes as well. They are more popular now than the private health, and, and more people are tapping into that because it's more... Um, accessible so knowing what they've got out there they're now reaching out more and um, firms will start to see when they get their end of year report from their provider of how many people have, have joined a service or particular service and to see right is actually getting used um, and it's just making sure that people know it's accessible and it's not just filling out lots of forms it is generally most of the time just a phone call yeah okay okay and uh, one of the initiatives I listen have is I think it's called I listen in the community Can you talk about that how you how you reach out into the community and the the value there that you you see and bring I think uh, yeah, a, a lot of the things that they're doing is uh, through the social media so through social media they're putting up a lot of things in terms of uh, ways in which people um, can maybe change the way they talk a lot of the events uh, obviously talk about what I listen services provide um, but they do different events as well in the, in the summer um, we also where the schools are on break do summer sessions different workshops that are on then as well I think the idea is to try to think in what ways the Isle of Man can try to change in terms of mental health stigma I think that's one of the goals um, I think they're achieving it because I, I've noticed the change here that People do seem to be able to, even mentioning services like I listen or talking about CAMS or mental health, it's more in people's language and more of an everyday way. So I think that's one of the changes. And I think that the community end is something that Alison is trying to grow as well. So how can we do more messages out towards people, connect with people, and potentially also bringing people together as well, talking mm -hmm. about that with themselves. 
Yeah. yeah, so for instance, for Mental Health Awareness Week, we've arranged certain you know, activities that hopefully will appeal, appeal to most people. So things like the C-DIP, mm-hmm. um, we're trying to, you know, embrace the C-DIP and what the, the positives from, from doing the C-DIP. Um, there's cake sales, there's, you know, dress for green, light up your building. Uh, so there's nature walks going on as well. So we try and do a lot of events throughout the year, to try and encourage people to join in and feel the benefits of that. Yeah, take that stigma away that you've yeah. I, I'd certainly say in my own just experience that generally seems to be reducing I'd mm-hmm. like to think so anyway certainly my observations uh, so when we're dealing with whether it's in the work and you've got work colleagues your home family friends you've got kind of tips I guess on if you see you know again it's for us all to help each other I guess and if we see signs of m- mental uh health or you know bubbling up above the surface yeah. signs that people perhaps look for um quite a lot um so it can be um different for um if someone maybe is down versus if someone is anxious um so with us all if, if there's too much on our plate we feel like there's a certain level which we can get to and then beyond that we feel anxious um so good news with that it's something we all experience where something feels like it's uh, bubbled up too much um so that would be things like where you might notice and change where someone seems more withdrawn um or they seem to be less focused or um they they seem to you know look more tired perhaps they haven't been sleeping well um In terms of um, down, what's interesting is with young people, they don't have some of the same look as adults. So say for an adult, if they're down, um, they might uh, struggle in terms of finding it hard to get out of bed, but also um, in terms of keeping up with appearance. So how, you know, in terms of washing, dressing, there might be a physical appearance change where you feel like someone looks quite different, haven't been looking after themselves. In young people, that doesn't happen. Um, So... That's just one of the things not to look out for, really, wow. in young people. Yeah. Um, but for them, it can be different. So um, there is some stats around uh, boys and girls being slightly different in terms of what you might notice. But I would think it's more helpful just to know the whole range. So where someone can seem more angry and more reactive, um, that can actually be a sign of depression. Um, so usually that's thought to be more for boys, but really it can be anyone. The idea behind that is that there's something going on and needs some way to come out there. Um, so more fights, more irritability. Um, if there seems to be some kind of change or someone's withdrawn as well, um, the, the best ways to know is those moments in our life where there's been an event happen, we have a normal reaction, which would be similar symptoms. And that's a, a nice way of thinking, yeah, I've been there. I can see that in that person. Yeah. I must be here. Uh... Or important, obviously, to, I suppose, to almost have a, like a blueprint of this, you know, and I suppose if it is family, friends, colleagues that you spend a lot of time with just to see that shift in, yeah. in pattern. And I guess if there's been a major event, perhaps some trauma, that if then there's a normal reaction out of that. But then if there's an extension of that, then yeah. I guess they're the kind of flags you. And parents find it hard with adolescents because there's quite an overlap. So say, for instance, teens staying in their room a lot, that's what teenagers do okay maybe they're strange with their eating okay that happens uh maybe they're moody yep again that definitely that, happens that, that, can, <laughs> that can happen um so the change would be um some people th- feel that they notice when someone moves to high school that that happens so that can be just adolescence but it's okay to check in and um, parents aren't always the ones where a uh, teen would, would go to them for advice on the parent end it's okay to say i am there um, and sometimes it's really obvious the parents say I notice so that would be where it's too much so the, the room is very messy they're very angry um, or if you notice that the sleep seems to be an issue um, it's okay to check in with the parents don't have to worry about trying to be a mini therapist yeah. check in is probably a good point yeah. isn't it why not just go and check ask the question yeah. Yeah, yeah. it could be nothing but it's better to ask Yeah, definitely so we get a bit more techy, if that's okay, Brian, yeah. around uh, uh, techniques. We touched on before we came on air, C, C, B, T, yep. and uh, <laughs> psychoanalytic therapy as well. You yep. have to run through those different, I guess, their techniques to yep. as part of your day-to-day role. 
Yeah, so um, CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Um, We're not taking notes, it's not an exam. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, they, they come from different mindset and um, psychodynamic or psychoanalytic, um, they, uh, they come from different ends. So uh, the history of it really would have been the, the psychodynamic um, Freud end around 1900, if people did want to write down. <laughs> that, um, um, that was the idea that a lot of things that might be going on for us is unconscious, we're not aware of it. Um, and the importance of something that's happened in our early childhood in, is the reason for our current problems. So um, looking at that, people would make relations between what's going on now in the past and in relationships um, and try to do things that um, try to what they call unleash the, the unconscious. So those parts, um, you can do that in different ways. So the analyst side would be um, potentially seeing someone five days a week for a very long time. Um, for a lot of people, that's helpful to try to help them better understand themselves and their identity. Um, psychodynamic, slightly different word from the same family, uh, would still think that it's important thinking about the past, important to past. With young people, the past was not that long ago, so more focus on our current relationships as well, so the patterns that happen there and the parts that make people feel stuck, making some suggestions, interpretations, what's that about? The idea that if you have an interpretation that is closer to the bone, that that might bring some relief. And then the person has options of, oh, I'm in this situation, how might I react now? CBT looks at the way we think and how that impacts the way we feel and what we do about it. So um, say for instance, uh, easy example would be something like, uh, you want to avoid somewhere, the thought would be, that's going to be a nightmare. I don't want to go there. Um, if you, you might have experienced in the past, you did go to that type of thing. You felt worried. You felt hot. You wanted to escape. And maybe you did escape. So then the behavior would have been the thing that you feel like has solved it. But then the thought keeps getting in the way of, I can't go to those types of things anymore. They're too much. I won't be able to handle it. And then the thought is then the thing that's a problem. With CBT, usually you work on the behavior side first. Um, then work on the thoughts. The reason why is so that you've had a chance of trying out what happens when I actually do go to those things that I thought was going to be impossible or I've avoided. Okay, it wasn't as bad. If it's a one-off, you might not believe it. So you go there so you have the feeling of relief and that things were okay. Then you can challenge the thoughts, which were uh, the ones that yeah. kind of get into trouble in the first place. Interesting. So it's almost like a rewiring of the... Yep. People yeah. definitely call it that as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's the non-technical <laughs> technical thing. And and obviously, the, it is. I say, is there an end? But mental health seems to be on the increase. Must be hard day to day. That it's a. There's a lot of value being added, but it continues to be a problem. But I can't say where's the end. But what what do you see as the future? Yeah. Will there be a plateau? Hopefully, where obviously the stigma goes. There's more dialogue, and then it's. Yeah. yeah, I think well, I think COVID will have will have a bump as a result of, of COVID and the ways in which people might have coped that might have resulted in them being unwell. Um, and I think generally, I, I really like this approach that I listen have done where trying to tackle people on the earlier ages. So from the high school, people will know resources, ways in which they can help, which they can use then as an adult. Um, and then at the primary school end, what's interesting about that is the things that people learn in terms of friendship issues, how to talk to people, how to say how you really feel, that they'll be talking back to their parents. So that automatically makes it allowable language. So by the time they then go into secondary school, I think we'll see hopefully an increase in the people that are able to even articulate how they might feel. So from the intervention end, that's much better. Someone can say, I feel this, I want a solution for this, rather than I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And I'd just like to also touch on, I know uh, uh, Zurich have been very good in supporting you guys. Just want to touch on what they do or have done and continue to do for you guys. For, for me, they've been absolutely brilliant. They, they understand um, and they support what we're trying to do and they fully believe and, and are, ba are backing us all the way. So any new initiatives, we run past them. They're very supportive of that, whether they attend sessions um, or they help us do things like... Um, 
uh, you know, like collections and in a supermarket, for instance, they'll, 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 you know, allocate some volunteers for us and they're so willing and enthusiastic. They've even painted some of our therapy rooms for us. So they don't just get involved with the sponsorship of the, you know, the finance side. They physically get involved and they spread a really good word about it and they are great ambassadors for us. Mm. So we, we can't thank them enough for, for helping, helping this charity and, and helping the local community at the, mm. wide, the wider scale of it. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. So, just lastly, then, corporates, individuals wanting to reach out, what's the best way for, for them to do that? So, we've got a great website. Um, it details everything that's going on, whether what we're doing in the community in regards to fundraising events and getting involved in different activities to support your mental health. We have um, courses available, so anything from mental health awareness for line managers to first aid, mental health first aiders, and then we have lovely bite-sized training, things like supportive listening and the circle of control, and we actually now introduce breakfast sessions, so we talked about before about how we have to be uh, flexible with our approach, how we deliver training. Um, People are so busy these days, either working at home or in the office or a mixture, um, we're now doing breakfast sessions, so that allows them to come in, have their training, set themselves up for the day, and then they can and doesn't interrupt their working day as much. And they seem to be working really, really well. And also, it gives them an opportunity to come and see where we are, our therapy rooms, and what we're all about, and what we're trying to achieve. So everything is on our website to um, to reach out if you need to, and also anything how you can help, whether you want to donate or get involved or sponsor an event anything like that we are all ears and um, we'll pick up the phone that's what we're here for old we, school phone old yeah. school phone we, we do that um, so you know we're, we're now 60 strong in our lesson wow. and everyone is quite surprised at that and you know it's grown so much in the last few years um, so we want to make sure we're still providing this service in years to come um, so yeah and for individuals again website's a good way to turn to Uh, For people for direct therapy, we can see people up to the age of 25. And what we also do is um, we take direct referrals from schools. So school teachers know how to reach out to us. And we can take referrals from parents as well. But if you're just not sure, um, or if someone wanted um, some mental health provision to jack out, does it fit for their service or staff? Um, Or just ask if they didn't understand from the website, get in touch and our team get back. Great. Check in, basically. Yeah. That's check the in theme. Yeah. yeah. Check in. Great. Thank you for joining. Much appreciated. Thanks for all the work you do in the community as well. It's much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everyone.